So Puzzle Lab 92 Part 2 <coughs> deals with the capital expenditure phase of the life cycle, the asset life cycle. So it talks about information delivery. It talks about the, the employer's information requirements, short, shorthand the EIRs, which is something the client and their advisors create at the start of the project. And basically, this, this document is very, very important because without it, you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing and what you've got to do. Because this is the why and the what. Because it's the employer saying, I want to use BIM on this project. This is what I'm trying to achieve. This is how you will use BIM. This is the information I want out of BIM. And this is how I will use BIM once you've finished your part of the project. And it's based upon things called the plain language questions, which you will find on the BIM Task Group website, which is a way of feeding people in to ask the right questions to produce the EIR. Otherwise, you end up in a situation where a client comes along and says, I want to do BIM on this project. And the project team say, yep, OK, I'm going to do that. And they go away, they do BIM, whatever it is. And then they come back at the end of the project and say, we did BIM, here you are. And the client says, that's not what I want. Why have you done this? It's no use to me whatsoever. It's very difficult to back engineer this stuff. You need to set these things up properly and do the strategic thinking at the right time. As an industry, we're not very good at doing that. We're very good at cracking on with doing stuff and not thinking about it. In BIM, you've got to think first before you act. You have to, otherwise you will go wrong. Because trying to unpick this stuff later on down the line is the devil's own business. And that's why if there is not an employer's information <coughs> requirement in place, that should ring an alarm bell and you need to go and get one. And then once you get to that point, you then have a BIM execution plan for the project, which is what it says. It's how you're going to make BIM work on the project. Part of that is understanding everybody's capability in the team, understanding how they use IT, what experience they've got of BIM, what platforms they use, you know, all that sort of stuff. Because basically, the, the strength of the BIM or the richness of it will be only as good as the weakest member of the team. And it may be, you know, some subcontractors, a lot of supply chains still haven't, are not into this stuff yet. They need support and help. So it may be that somebody needs to help them engage with the BIM environment. Whether that's through a consultant or through the main contractor, who knows. But these are all things that you need to work out, again, before you get too far into the project. Part of, this <coughs> part of this is roles and responsibilities. And again, we're probably all familiar with sorts of matrices which set out, again, who is doing what, when have they got to do it, what are they responsible for, what, what are they producing, all these sorts of things. And then this is an interesting one here, which I think is really, um, it throws clash detection on its head. Because whenever we talk about 3D modeling, someone says, oh yeah, and clash detection, it's fantastic. We, we put all the models together in Navisworks, and then we produce these reports with thousands of thousands of clashes in them. Fantastic. And then we sit in meetings that last for days, working out who's going to sort out what clash. Great. That works really well, doesn't it? <clears throat> Clearly, I'm talking too much. Right. Um, basically, Mervyn actually has a very different spin on this. And I think if you, if you read the standard properly, you'll come across a volume coordination strategy. Because basically, this is about having a clash-free design. Because everybody is working <coughs> within their own volume, which you've laid out in your matrix of responsibility, so that people are producing their design within parameters that you've agreed as a team. And so then you worked out, when you're working within that volume, how you're going to touch 
and interface with each other, and that's why you have an interface manager. It may all be what, the same person, but it, it, it doesn't really matter. But it's a very different way to actually throwing it all into the washing machine and then getting a class report out. It's actually thinking about how you put the model together and how everybody works, because this way it minimises the clashes you're going to have and helps you manage the process. But actually it's no different to what we used to do or what we do now in analog world. You know, architect designs a scheme, sets up a concept and produces a spatial matrix if you like. You know, these are the zones for the columns, this is where the floor slabs go, this is the ceiling void, these are the service risers, this is where the services go, all that sort of stuff. You know, and basically a good concept architect will be working that stuff out and will know how these things sort of fit together in a conceptual sense. So the detail can be developed safely with minimal risk so that things actually fit within the zones that have been allocated to them. Now and then they don't, you know, it's either something structural happens or the architect wants to change the design or the client does, does something or the service's design grows for some reason. And so you've got to start shifting things around, but it's a very controlled process. And this is just the same, and I, I find this very interesting, that you can, you can have a strategy for constructing a model to minimise the need for clash detection, which is what everybody seems to latch on to. And then as we get to the end of the process that 1192 uh, talks about, it looks towards 1192 part 3, which is all about life cycle, and we'll see how this fits together in a minute. Of course, we, would be, we, we have to recognise that uh, there's already certification happening in the industry now. And BDP recently achieved level two compliance certification from BRE. They're the first company in the world to achieve this, which is, uh, which is great. And it's, uh, it's a feather in the cap for BDP and BRE and the task group, really. I think it's great. So, this is a diagram. How am I doing for time? Yeah, I'm okay. Um, this is a diagram from 1192, and I've covered parts of it up because it's really complicated. So I'm, go I'm going to let you see it a bit at a time so that we can sort of work through this together. Because this diagram really, together with the, the diagram I'm going to show you from part three, says it all. And if you can get this, you've got it. You've, well, in my opinion, anyway. So, here we are. So we've got different things going on here. We've got, we're producing some information. We've talked about information, so that shouldn't be a surprise. And we're talking about developing information, detailed information, through the design process. And that shouldn't be a surprise. We've talked about the asset life cycle, and it has different stages, so that's not a surprise either. Uh, we've talked about a bit about information data exchanges, so we're putting, taking information out of the model environment and we're also pumping information back in. <coughs> and what does the client want to do at different points? They want to make decisions based on the information that they get from the model, from the, from the CDE. So let's see how this breaks down. So, digital plan of work, these are the stages. Uh, if you're familiar with the RRBA stage E, it no longer exists. We now live in a world where we work from zero to seven. Uh, zero isn't on here because it's strategic thinking, eff effectively. But we have stages one to seven on this diagram. So those are the stages of the life cycle. And this is... Wait, wait for it, I will unveil the information in a minute. But this is the information growing through the design stages. And this is the information that we are producing. So we produce a graphical model, that's the 3D geometry, we're familiar with that. We produce some non-graphical data, which could, may well be stored in a proper database, like an SQL database or something similar, which links and tags to the geometry. And that data could be all sorts of things. It could be cost. 
it could be performance, it could be uh, post-occupancy evaluation information, it could be benchmarking data, cost, leading times, environmental stuff, carbon emissions, energy consumption, operations and maintenance information, maintenance cycles, replacement cycles, all sorts of things. So that's non-graphical digital data. And then there'll be documentation, because we always produce paper. <coughs> so we've got digital information, we've got geometry, we've got data, and we've got a pile of paper and CDs and all the stuff we usually have. And we're developing this through the design stages. So there's no, there's no great surprise here, because we're expecting the majority and level of information to develop as we go through the process. If we know less by the time we got to the end than when we started, we're in trouble. So then we've got some information exchanges, which are the green footballs. And this is either pulling information out of the environment or putting information back in. And that could be all sorts of things, you know, adding to the design information, performance data, cost data, whatever. And we've got red footballs, which are the key decision points for the client. And the reason for this being shown like that is because this, this is aligning with the public sector procurement processes. All the government departments are aligning their procurement to a lesser or greater extent with this sort of process. So decision points are in the sort of same place. They're asking for the same sort of data requirements. So people working across the public sector can expect to see the same sorts of things going on. And then round the outside, you've just got the the cycle. And we've looked at the cycle. So we start with some strategy. What's the employer's information requirement? What are they trying to do here through procurement and so on? So actually, in a way, at first sight, this looks really complicated. But when you understand it, I think actually it's very simple and encapsulates everything we're talking about. And then there's another part to 1192 part three. Uh, which is uh, basically a work sharing process which again is no different to what we've always done except that they call it something slightly different. So, in a practice, say it was my architect's practice, I'm working with my team, we're kicking ideas around and we're saying, what do you think about this? Maybe I can do it this way. So that's work in progress. So we, we get to a point where suddenly we decide, actually, it'd be good if we could share this, some of this stuff with our team. So actually, we share it with other members of our team. And we state the purpose of why we're doing that and what we're looking for and that sort of thing. And that our, our team members, our other external team members, they think about it, kick it around as well. And eventually, we reach an agreed solution for whatever it is, and that might be the structural grid, the structural frame, the building envelope, the services, strategy, whatever, and we publish it. So that then that is put up in the client shared area as reliable information that crystallizes the design of that aspect, whatever it is, at that point. And it can be used in a certain way, which is defined by the way it's issued. And then when it's superseded, it gets archived. And really, this is what we've always done anyway. It's just they've put a name to it. And that's all I'd say about this. <laughs>